Welcome to the webinar on battery energy systems. My name is Julie, a professor of energy materials and systems at MIT. The cost of lithium ion batteries have came down a lot in the last 10 years from about $1,000 per kilowatt hour to uh, around $150 uh, per kilowatt hour now. And this was driven by the huge growth in the electric vehicles uh, industry. The supply chain uh, really put down the cost of battery cells today to less than $90 per kilowatt hour. The pack is uh, really double that uh, to less than $180 per kilowatt hour. And this is near the price break even point for this kind of container scale battery energy system to uh, utilize the intermittent wind and solar electricity for electrical grid. Uh, in a recent Imperial College study uh, where people look at 12 grid application scenarios from energy arbitrage, primary, secondary, tertiary response to peaker replacement, black start, seasonal storage to power quality and reliability, lithium ion batteries wins in 10 out of the 12 uh, grid application scenarios. Uh, beating pumped hydro, compressed air, redox flow battery, sodium sulfur, lead acid, uh, hydrogen, and uh, mechanical flywheel, etc. And in a recent study by uh, Professor Jessica Transic and Yeming Chang at MIT, uh, they look at this so called equivalent availability factor, where the cost calculation shows that. Uh, in places like Arizona and Texas, uh, if the battery pack cost is $150 per kilowatt hour, which are basically now today, uh, you can basically use uh, wind and solar for 90% of the time. And in other words, uh, in 19 out of 20 days, uh, you can use renewable and only use the natural gas and fossil fuel power plants as, the, as an emergency power source in sort of uh, one day out of three weeks uh, if the wind doesn't blow uh, in, in three weeks. And so we're basically here already. Uh, is this, uh, so what's the problem? Uh, is this the cycle life of the battery? Uh, actually in electric vehicle industry, people have already demonstrated uh, deep charge, discharge cycling to 5,000, 7,000 cycles. And with advanced pre-lization technology and electrolyte development, uh, you can even drive it to 10,000, 20,000 cycles. Uh, so uh, for example, at MIT, uh, we are developing methods to produce this ultra thin lithium alloy foil, uh, thinner than uh, four microns. Traditionally, you cannot roll lithium foil to that thing because they stick to the roller. By tuning the alloy chemistry, we're able to do that and can be used to mechanically preliciate graphite uh, anodes. And it also has very good air stability, which is going to reduce the manufacturing cost. And you can use it to preliciate uh, high capacity silicon graphite anode as well. Uh, another issue uh, to consider is, uh, well, do we have enough of a lithium resource? So, uh, this is indeed a, a very big problem because if you look at how much uh, minerals you need uh, in a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack for an electric vehicle, you end up needing to excavate and move uh, half a million pound, uh, ton or half a million pound, half a million pounds of ores. And uh, that is going to have a huge uh, ecological uh, impact as well as burden on the transportation and the manufacturing and the whole economy. So this is really uh, a civilization scale endeavor uh, to move everything to electric. However, in the grand scheme of things, uh, there is uh, enough uh, lithium on earth to support uh, about a, uh, at least uh, a factor of 100 scaling up of lithium ion batteries from the current uh, industry. And a very important factor uh, in this uh, is reuse and recycling. So we should take 
the retired uh, EV batteries for uh, second life and also for recycling so they can go into uh, the stationary st uh, storage uh, uh, systems. So uh, given the above, uh, I think uh, grid scale storage with lithium ion battery uh, is an imminent reality. It's already happening uh, and it's going to happen a lot more in the next uh, five to 10 years. However, there are two uh, outstanding technical problems. Uh, one is fire safety and the other is recycling to prevent unintended consequences. Uh, in South Korea alone, there were uh, more than 20 fires uh, in about 500 stationary storage system in a time span of three years. And very interestingly, uh, the cause of the fire is not all due to the battery pack. Uh, sometimes it's the low voltage uh, grid uh, interface, sometimes it's the uh, power electronic, sometimes it's the control systems. So uh, uh, we need to have a, a systematic approach uh, to uh, improving the, the safety. And generally uh, you can get an energy efficiency of about 80%. The reason for the fire is because in the battery cell, uh, you have uh, this liquid uh, electrolytes, which has high uh, vapor pressure. And also the active materials uh, themselves can release oxygen when uh, being heated up. So uh, you can have a uh, thermal runaway, which is uncontrollable and eventually uh, will lead to explosion because of the volatility uh, of, of what contains inside. And uh, at MIT, we're developing uh, electrolytes which uh, have very high performance. For example, recently uh, in collaboration with Professor Jeremiah Johnson and Professor Yang Shaohuang, we have developed a high voltage uh, electrolyte that you can charge this uh, nickel rich uh, NCM811 material to uh, 4.7 volt and which give you a very high energy density and very good cycle life. Uh, and also uh, what we can show is that uh, if there is this thing called Coulombic inefficiency and the uh, battery cycle life is basically inversely proportional to this number. And by having more fluorine uh, in the electrolyte, we can exponentially reduce the Coulombic inefficiency and therefore exponentially increase uh, the battery cycle life. However, to balance uh, the uh, cell performance and power density uh, with fire safety, uh, you really need to have a good balance. And so at MIT, we're doing uh, this robotic liquid handlers and active machine learning to automatically tune the liquid co compositions to achieve this good balance. And this is expected to significantly improve the safety as well as the economy of the battery. Another very important aspect is hardware sensors and protective measures. Uh, one of my uh, previous students, uh, now Professor Yang Jin, uh, he has made an interesting discovery that when you have a fast charging of the graphite inode, sometimes you have uh, the silicium metal precipitation, which is a very dangerous uh, thing because it can uh, create a micro short. Uh, but he found that uh, Whenever that happens, uh, there is a little hydrogen bubbles that's generating the battery and it's very difficult actually to confine them uh, in the battery cell. So just by installing a hydrogen gas sensor uh, in this kind of container, uh, he showed that you can have as much as a 15 minute early warning uh, of a very local uh, short uh, before there is any thermal signature on the battery casing. So this provides uh, precious early warning systems uh, for emergency handling. And also another very important aspect is software and battery management systems. Uh, at MIT, we're developing these uh, new network-based uh, battery diagnostic tools where by looking at the voltage capacity curve uh, of the battery with just a few or even just one cycle, uh, we can have an accurate uh, prediction of the future battery performance through uh, this uh, deep neural network. And for the first time, we're able to predict 
how a used battery uh, would have its residual life, as well as how the voltage and capacity would decay over thousands of cycles with error that's only like 30, 50 cycles. Uh, uh, and, and this would allow us to, uh, for the pack manufacturers to select the most cost effective but high performance, high reliability cells, as well as for state of health diagnostics and uh, emergency uh, uh, handling systems. So uh, uh, all in all, uh, we can uh, treat the safety problem, but there is yet another problem of so-called renewable waste or green waste. And this is really uh, becoming a serious problem. So we, we have to remember that uh, carbon dioxide is a component of a long vector of possible pollutants. And uh, in batteries, there is heavy metals like cobalt and eco. Uh, there is this uh, liquid uh, electrolyte, which is a persistent organic pollutant uh, that's carcinogenic. There are also plastic packaging and separators inside. So uh, we really have to think about uh, in terms of the battery manufacturing and battery chemistry, how to design the battery so they're easy to re reuse and recycle. And right now, uh, the situation is really bad. Only uh, less than 10% of lithium ion batteries are recycled. Most of them end up in landfill. So this is really not acceptable. And at MIT, we're developing uh, light recycling of uh, cathode powders, uh, such as waste uh, lithium ion phosphate. So you have this so-called black mass, uh, which is a uh, used material that's uh, scraped off from the current collector. And very often there is already some graphite that's uh, mixed uh, in this waste, or we can intentionally mix with some of the anode graphite. And by adding in a little bit of lithium salt and sustaining a, a microwave treatment just for tens of seconds, uh, we can show that we can achieve uh, realization of the uh, uh, iron phosphate, which have a very good nanostructure. And uh, we show that uh, this uh, microwave treated uh, uh, recycled lithium iron phosphate has almost the same kind of a rate performance as the new uh, uh, cathode powders with only one third of the cost. And we have cycled this uh, uh, light recycled uh, <clears throat> cathode powder for uh, 1600 cycles. So uh, this is sort of the grand dream uh, and where uh, we're gonna have uh, battery cells uh, which cost less than $50 per kilowatt hour uh, and the battery uh, system cost about $90 per kilowatt hour and we can use them for uh, 20,000 cycles. Uh, and uh, by doing this uh, shallow recycling, uh, the, the hope is we have very little additional energy input and uh, very little uh, material input and no pollution, we can achieve yet another five times more uh, reuse of uh, the cell material. So goal is to have a completely closed material circle where you can use uh, the renewable electricity plus uh, a nuclear electricity to drive a fully uh, closed uh, material circle and to have this kind of an immortal energy system. You know, in the end, you can do parametallurgical uh, <clears throat> recycling of the material with a fully closed uh, lithium cobalt nickel loop, as well as uh, fluorine and, and phosphorus because they could be uh, pollutants. And with just adding uh, some water and carbon, we can have this uh, immortal energy system to drive our electrified economy. And <clears throat> it's not the capital cost. It's not the uh, OPEX uh, doppling cost. Uh, mining manufacturing, very challenging. Uh, we need to have like 20, 30% growth year over year uh, in the next two decades in order to meet 
the goal of cutting down carbon dioxide emission by 50% uh, by 2040, 2050, uh, which is our obligation, but uh, it's fundamentally doable. However, uh, there are just these uh, technical issues and there is really no sort of showstopper, but there is just a lot of detailed uh, chemical engineering, uh, material science engineering, mechatronics, uh, software engineering uh, that needs to happen uh, in the next 20 years. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to stop and uh, be happy to get your questions. Thank you.